images and voices of people who have died. Hello, I'm Stan Grant. In 1967, I was four years old, and this is my hometown, Griffith. I was too young to know it then, but my life and the life of this country was about to change. It'd been a long struggle for justice by Indigenous people, and the rest of Australia was now coming together to say yes. This is the story of those times. In the 1960s, Australia is a pretty good place to be. The darkness of the war years feels a lifetime ago. This is a land of sunshine and hope. Our surfers rule the waves. Our cricketers conquer the pitch. New cars run off the production line. Everyone has a job. Friday is on everyone's mind. And change is coming for those locked out of the Australian dream. An Aboriginal footballer from Western Australia, Polly Farmer, becomes a hero to a generation of white kids who love their Aussie rules. Jimmy Little takes Royal Telephone to the top of the charts. Lionel Rose becomes a world champion and draws bigger crowds than the Beatles. Test newcomer Beatson rucking the ball out. And Arthur Beatson takes a giant stride towards becoming the first Indigenous person to captain a national sporting team. The walls are coming down. Charles Perkins loads a bus with his fellow Sydney University students and rides to freedom. He opens up swimming pools and cinemas that keep blacks out. I have a dream. As Martin Luther King speaks of his dream, Australians dream too. It is time to extend the fair go to the first Australians. White Australians send black Australians a message. You count. I'm a child of a revolution. In the 1960s, I'm born into an Aboriginal family in New South Wales. We live on the margins of an Australia that doesn't really recognise us. We were outcasts. We were never, we were never, never Australian in those, in those days. This is my father, Stan. I'm named after him. This is the park he used to take me to as a boy. He has lived a long life, a hard scrabble life, that has taken him from the discarded fringes of Australia to being celebrated as an elder of his people, the Wiradjuri. I still see him as the tough footballer and boxer who worked on sawmills to feed his family. I don't remember him being a political man, and even now it surprises me when I hear him speak of that time when in the eyes of his country, he barely existed. The 67 referendum gave us the, the right to be citizens in a country that was ours in the first place. He tells me stories of hard times, segregation and brutality, beatings at the hands of police, and his fears for me, for his kids. I didn't want to run up at sawmills. I wanted to get educated and do things. But I just, I was, I was, I, the fear was that you would be asked to leave school at a young age, and I think that happened to you actually, is that uh, I think that, I, I, that was my fear, that all, all my kids, my four children, would be asked to leave school and to get out of school because they are black. My father's fears are the fears born of a harsh history. The National Archives in Canberra is a time machine Behind these walls is another world, the past. It holds the story of who we were and what we have become. I'm here to go back to that moment when Australia became a nation. Federation, January 1, 1901. We are proud to have sprung from the same race as the inhabitants of the British Isles. And here in a darkened room, is our founding document, the Constitution. It is fragile and fading, preserved now under glass.
Today, it is being carefully removed for me. Inside are three lines, one small section so clinical and technical, so matter of fact, yet to read it today sounds so utterly chilling. It is a rare privilege to be able to hold the Constitution and I admit that in doing so I really feel the weight of history, but it's also conflicting. If I go to the back of the document to section 127 that reads, in reckoning the numbers of the people of the Commonwealth or of a state or other part of the Commonwealth, Aboriginal natives shall not be counted. They're talking about people like my family. And even now, it's hard to read. Why would we, a people whose ancestors have lived on this land for tens of thousands of years, be so excluded? For that answer, I have to go back to the language and the attitudes of the day. Aborigines are a doomed race. Australia is smoothing the dying pillow. Listen to Alfred Deakin, one of our founding fathers and second prime minister. If they be a dying race, let us hope that in their last hours, they will be able to recognize not simply the justice, but the generosity of the treatment which the white race, who are dispossessing them and entering into their heritage, are according them. If you read the um, constitutional convention transcripts, the, um, the speeches about Aboriginal people are just hair raising. It's vile racism um, and a murderous intent to wipe us off the face of the earth. I'm Marcia Langton. In 1967, I was 16 years old. Marcia was a schoolgirl then. Today, she is Professor Langton from Melbourne University. You heard the word races. You heard the term the inferior races, but you didn't hear the term racism. But of course it was, it was a finely tuned system of racist segregation that I grew up under. But I just didn't understand that that's what it was. What does it do to people to feel as if they don't count? It makes you angry. When, by the time you figure out what's going on, you think, now, why am I walking on this side of the street and they're all walking on that side of the street? And then you ask people and nobody will talk about it and you keep asking until you start to figure out a few things because there's a pattern to it. You know, it's, it's repeated all through life. The blacks sit down the back of the class. The blacks sit down the back of church, you know. Um, or they just refuse your service. He recently walked over and he said, what are you doing, you fellas? Go down and your story, I can't serve you. Aye? No, I can't serve you. Well, why can't you serve you? I drink you all the time. I can't serve you. OK, uh, what's the problem? <laughs> you know what the problem is, mate. You're Aborigines. By the time I am born in 1963, we are separated and segregated, but we have not died out. We are clinging to our communities. This is home for many of my family, an Aboriginal settlement on the outskirts of Griffith. To white people, it is out of sight and out of mind. It could take us an hour just to walk into town. It's still here today. The houses are newer, but the families are the same. These are the families who come from the 19th century missions of New South Wales. During World War II, my grandfather, not properly recognised in this country, signs up to fight. After the war, our people settled in Griffith for work. Around us, Aboriginal resistance is stirring. Gather round people, I'll tell you a story, an eight year long story. In the Northern Territory, a wiry stockman named Vincent Lingiari leads a walk-off from the vast Vestes cattle station. The Gurindji people want equal wages, but it grows into something more. 
They want their land back. I met Gurindji men who were there on the stage uh, with the women. They were talking about how they um, worked from sun up till 10 o'clock at night for no wages. They um, talked about the abuse of their young daughters and girls uh, uh, who were abused by the white stockmen. They couldn't stop those things. I was horrified. Uh, I had no idea that these things were going on. I'm Shirley Peasley, and in 1967, I was 25 years old. Shirley signs up to campaign for change, starting a lifetime of a struggle for justice. This is about um, uh, telling the Australia that we're worthy of being counted. Well, this is a clear-cut violation of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. I'll give you four. Young I'm white Australians one. join the struggle too. They pile onto the bus for Charlie Perkins' freedom ride. It is a journey into a country divided, where blacks are banned from public places. We don't have jobs. We don't have um, legal representation. There are people, our people are just lining up at the courts. The jails are full of our people. Um, we need education for our children. The schools are not happy to take our children. You couldn't own a block of land. You couldn't own a house, you had to rent one. You, you, you couldn't be out at late, at, late at night, you had, you, had to, you had to be gone before sundown from the street. There were many, many things we couldn't do, and uh, one of the things that I, I do remember clearly was that we, we couldn't uh, uh, go out with white people. You couldn't marry a white girl in those days, you know, without, without permission from the, the mission people. You can't trust a bloody black fella, no matter where he is, eh? Mm. And he, he gets on the plonk and he won't work. A few of them nice and they're clean, they wear nice clothes and everything, but most of them wear, are all dirty and everything. Yet Australia is changing. No, I think dark people are on the skin. They look very good, I think, very nice. W would, you, would you marry a, a black person? Yes, I would. Oh, I don't think it's fair that someone just for the colour of their skin and their race shouldn't be given the same opportunities that Europeans are given in Australia. I'm Sol Belair. I was around about 18, 17, 18 in 1967, still at school. Sol Belair is getting an education in race politics and getting white Australians out on the streets with him. They were all demonstrating for, you know, the blacks in South Africa. Um, the blacks in the US, North and South Vietnam. And we said, hang on, these things are happening here. We'd, we'd, we'd go and tell, you know, because we'd go into those demonstrations or we'd go into the meetings and we'd say, this is what's happening to Aboriginal people. Australia is a big adventure for these people. It takes courage to settle in a new country, learn new customs, new traditions... The old white Australia is blended with new faces coming from Europe and Asia. We are meeting each other. The first Greek wedding I ever went to was when we worked in the chocolate factory and we had lots of Greek friends and Italian friends because this was not long after the migration out here after the war. And so lots of um, European families came out and they worked in the factories as well, so we made our friends with them. And those friendships lasted a long, long time, even after we all left those factories and those factories closed down. I'm Millie Ingerman, 1967, I was 27. 27-year-old Millie crosses the colour line, marries a white man. It raises some eyebrows, and not just from white people. In some people's eyes, but if you think about everybody else, when you get into a relationship, my God, that would be stupid. I mean, they're going to have the... You know, some people want a totally black race. I said, well, what's the difference between you and Hitler with his Aryan race? <laughs> what was it like going out on the street? How did people react to you being together? How was he treated? I don't know whether he received anything. I never, I've never ed ed copped anything from it. But I do remember that when we went um, looking for a place to live, he had to go. I couldn't do it. Uh, I ran in Redfern, the taxis wouldn't pull up, so I pushed him out the front to get the taxi. <laughs> so he, he was convenient, I suppose, <laughs> more just as much as anything. <laughs> Australians, black and white, and everything in between. 
are marrying each other. They are protesting. To them, it feels like a revolution with its own soundtrack. Here comes the Supremes. Here comes the Four Tops. Here comes the Temptations. Here comes the Blues. But, oh, gee. And you could relate to that, and that was music about, you know, about a revolution and about everything that was going on in the States, and we loved it. There is a new political voice. It comes from the US civil rights movement and echoes all the way to Australia. You were a radical. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I had a biggest afro. I mean, some of the early photos, God, you know, I'll look at them down thinking, how did I get a comb through that, you know? For my family and me, life is spent on the road. We move from town to town. My parents search for work, but there is another concern, the threat of welfare officers taking their children. I changed schools more than a dozen times. Elsewhere, other Aboriginal people too are fighting to get an education. My father reminds me of a time when Aboriginal students were invisible. In the public school, I, I, I went there for quite some time and uh, we went back a few years ago, Aunty Flo and I, I think Uncle Herb was there, more than there too. We went through the, the, the uh, enrolment book you know, I, I went to school for about four years. I never was never enrolled in school. That, that's, that shocked me and embarrassed me as well. Because all my mates were saying, Stan, you, you went to school. Of yeah, course, you know I did. I was separate. Yeah. yeah, come in on in the book. It's, it was embarrassing. Why? It was embarrassing. Because try, try Aboriginal to kids. Because I was black then. The English teacher um, taught a poem in class. Um, and it was about, you know, the darkies down in the creek using soap. And it, you know, had that McGonagall pentameter. Da 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 da. The darkies in the creek with the bar of soap. Da 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 da. Um, and it was, you know, supposed to be funny. And I stood up and said, uh, I find that racist and unacceptable. She said, you get out of my class now. I'm reporting you to the principal. So I was sent to the principal and I was um, expelled from school. You had your teachers that would come up and talk to you about life after school and, and your career. So a career advisor sort of thing. And he, he looked at me, he went around all the, all the class and said, well, you'll be such and such, you're, you come from a farming family, so you'll be a farmer and all that. When he got to me, he said, Sol, he said, your people, all they can do is play sport or sing. He says, so you really need to know if you're going to become a singer or a sportsman. Vote yes for Aborigines, they want to be Australians too. Vote but for young people like Sol, their ambitions are about to become much bigger. The referendum is on Saturday and it's important that we should have the maximum vote because the eyes of the world are on Australia. It is on that day, May 27, 1967, that Australians will say yes. The result of the referendum on the Aboriginal question was a resounding triumph for the Aboriginal cause. Australia recorded a yes vote of nearly 91%. Ah, oh, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I didn't think that people cared that much about it. <laughs> By 1967, it has been a long struggle, a decade of campaigning. The late Faith Bandler, a woman of South Sea Island descent, not Indigenous, is the champion who inspires others, among them Shirley Peasley. We were so happy from uh, dancing in the street and holding hands and singing and I think they must have thought we were all very crazy. Today I go back over those old ballot forms. Here is the tally of votes all recorded by hand. Australians tick yes in numbers never seen before or since. This country that had told Aboriginal people they would die out now includes us. So much hope. The good thing that came out of that was the 90% that voted for us. And I've always said, uh, and I give lots of talks these days, and I always say that that 90% is still out there. They're just not heard. <laughs> Thank you.
1967 is a watershed year, but there are those who do not feel part of this change. When the 1967 referendum came out, and the issue was whether the Australian people supported the federal government taking control of Aboriginal affairs, white Tasmanians believed it had absolutely nothing to do with them because there were no Aborigines here. Until 1967, the states made laws for Aboriginal people. It meant there was so much uncertainty from voting rights to where you could live, even if you were classified as Aboriginal. The referendum changed that. Not only were people now going to be counted in the census, but the federal parliament could make laws for all Indigenous people. The torch now passes to a new generation of black activists. They are militant and impatient. They set up a tent embassy on the lawns of parliament in Canberra. There is a new cry for land rights and treaties. Aboriginal people finally got the publicity they needed and they got the publicity because of the um, international press, the international journalists and the international um, politicians that were asking questions of government why are those people over there in their own embassy and what they said were aliens that are in our own country. Hi, I'm Gail Marbo. In 1967 I was two years old. Gail Marbo's father, Eddie, is watching and planning a court case that will shake the foundations of Australia. For me, my dad was, is my hero. And what he did to help Indigenous Australia was fantastic. More than two decades after the referendum, this man from the Torres Strait fights all the way to the High Court. He doesn't live to see victory that our country is never the same. When Mabo won, it overturned a ruling of 200 years that denied Indigenous Australia the rights to their land. Because with Captain Cook coming in, he took all of Australia as crown land. So therefore, if you were an inhabitant of this place, you had no rights under the planting of the flag and him deeming it to be in the name of the Queen. And Dad said, no, I'm 17th generation. I do have a right. And so he took on the battle to change that law. The Mabo decision leads to the Native Title Act increasing the footprint of Aboriginal-owned land in Australia. And Eddie Marbo's grave today is a national shrine visited by Prime Ministers. Tony Abbott visited your father's grave, laid a wreath, and it was an emotional thing for him. How did it feel for you when you see someone like the Prime Minister as he was then visiting your father's grave? For me, the conversation I had in the bus before we got to Dad's grave was interesting because I was listening to a real man. My name's Luke Taylor. I wasn't around in 1967, but my grandfather was. Today, the grandchildren of those 67 campaigners, like Luke Taylor, carry the legacy. I want Australia to be a place where people are proud of their Indigenous heritage and not just Aboriginal people. Other non-Indigenous people were proud to say, yeah, I live on a land where Aboriginal heritage is huge, it's great, we've got dream time stories, we've got art, we've got language, and it's amazing. Ultimately, I want my daughter to be able to go from Cape York to New York to be and be proud of her Aboriginal heritage. Change has come and life has turned for the better, for some of us. 50 years ago, my father did not count. Two years ago, I am there as he is awarded a doctorate for writing the first dictionary in our language, Wiradjuri. But 1967 was a battle only half won. We are reminded still that for too many of the first peoples of this land, life is unbearably hard. Indigenous people are still the most impoverished, the most imprisoned 
the first Australians die 10 years younger than the rest of the country. There are new campaigns, a fight for recognition, for treaties. The voices of 67 echo still. People gone, a time passed. Australia is a different country, perhaps a more divided country. Do you think if not, the, the referendum of 1967 was put to the people today, that it would succeed? No. No, because the 1967 referendum, the two parties had joined together to push for a yes vote. And because all the, the, the constituents of the people of the two parties all probably listened to their local members, so they all voted yes. And um, that's how it came about. You will never get an agreement in this day and age from those two parties to have a yes vote. Yes. So do you, do you like doing Aboriginal studies? Yes. yes. In Canberra, on the steps of Old Parliament House, I meet a new generation of Australian kids. For them, the vote of 1967 is part of their history. And they don't carry the baggage of our country's dark past. And when did you learn about the 67 referendum? Um, ten months. Yeah. 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 And what? What do you What do you think it was about? In 1967, what happened? <laughs> the government made a series of laws for Aboriginals, and Australia voted yes for them. They made laws. That's right. The, the Parliament. Of laws. If there was a referendum today, would you vote yes? Yes. You would. <laughs> So do you think Australia would have been a good place back in the 60s? No. No? No? Now Indigenous leaders are gathering in Uluru in a push for a new referendum to finish the job of 67 and to fully recognise Indigenous people in the constitution that was written to exclude us. And Luke Taylor is following in his grandfather's footsteps fully involved in the struggle. I have a photo of him on my desk. I've got his ashes at home and uh, I sit there and look at him sometimes. Every time I think I get a bit sidetracked or anything like that, um, I look at him and think, nah, all right, look, get, get your thing together and let's do it. The origins of this terrible treatment of Aboriginal people, this terrible hatred of Aboriginal people, it's all there in our constitution. That's where it begins. That's the expression of it. Get rid of it and you'll feel proud to be Australian. What ranks me a bit, it wrinkles me a fair bit actually, it, us blackfellas, Aboriginal people, have got to stand in line behind the non-Indigenous people of this country for them to say yes or no. Shirley Peasley still remembers when she did not stand behind her fellow Australians but stood side by side with a song of change. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. And deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. And for that day, in 1967, we did. All of us in Australia, we did. From the 1967 referendum,